Um, so we'll just go ahead and get started in just a second. Right. Um, so on the line here, um, my name is David Meller. I work at the Center for Open Science. Um, I work on journal initiatives and our competition to reward um, researchers for pre-registration. So that's obviously the content of this webinar today. Um, also on the line is Courtney Soderberg. Hello. Hi. <laughs> um, Courtney is our statistical and methodological consultant, um, and she's our basically our stats wizard here, and leads our training efforts at the Center for Open Science. So she'll be available um, throughout the webinar to help answer questions, um, and also at the end as questions arise too. Um, Courtney, feel free to stay online or mute yourself or go away whenever um, you see fit. Sounds good. Um, also available here if you want to peek in, Alex DeHaven. Um, also works with the our, our journal and funder initiatives here at the Center for Open Science. So here at COS, our mission is to increase the um, rigor and reproducibility of um, the published literature. And um, the main tactic we use to achieve that mission is to make science more open, more reproducible, to make um, every part of the research workflow um, transparently clear to the entire research community. Um, so our main strategy for achieving that is to align ideal scientific practice, practices, scientific values with the um, actual day-to-day -day, um, rewards and incentives that individual researchers face um, in the um, publications, grants, and, and um, promotion structure that, that we all face. So uh, uh, ideal scientific practice is to openly share all the available evidence, whereas as a day-to-day -day reality, individual researchers are more rewarded for, for secrecy, for keeping something um, hidden until it's ready to be revealed. Likewise, ideal scientific practices are to um, be motivated by knowledge and open discovery, as opposed to being motivated by self-interest and, and competition um, between individuals. An ideal scientific practice is to consider all new evidence, even when it contradicts something that's um, you worked on before, as opposed to the more day-to-day -day rewards that we all face, um, having a vested interest in one's prior work or prior claims. In an ideal scientific world, we publish a relatively few number of large studies, um, and the evidence presented in, in those studies would be complicated. There'd be null findings and messy evidence, just like reality is messy. Um, on the other hand, work is more publishable, um, and you get more publications with many small studies um, with fairly surprising and clean results. And the take home message for all this is that incentives for individual researchers are focused on getting something published, getting something out there. That's what we're rewarded for, not for getting it right. And the way to make something more publishable is to find those clean findings, find those um, you know, surprising, um, statistically significant and clean findings. And the best analogy I know of to explain how that's really feasible um, with any sort of data collection or any sort of study effort is um, Gelman and Loken's Garden of Forking Paths. So what this represents is um, basically any research question followed by its analysis, followed by its um, testing. So you start with a very straightforward question. It's, are these two variables related to each other? And that sounds like a very specific hypothesis. Does f affect y? Does um, you know, uh, do um, the gender names affect the, the um, potential danger of a hurricane? Or whatever your um, question is, um, it starts out fairly specific sounding. But in reality, um, as you start the analysis, analysis path, each individual question you ask bifurcates the number of analyses you have. So to use the, um, when you're constructing variables, use the mean, the median, or maybe some more complex index. Um, do you exclude outliers? If so, what's your rule for excluding them? Do you control for time or money or height or socioeconomic status, et cetera, et cetera? You've got many, many different decisions to make um, from going to that fairly specific sounding um, hypothesis or prediction to the actual analysis you make. And each one of those, again, creates a new hypothesis, a new analysis plan. Um, and after a fairly short number of those analyses, you get, or those decisions, you get expon exponentially larger dozens, hundreds, or maybe even thousands of different possible analyses. And um, each of those decisions, you know, in hindsight, is perfectly justifiable. Um, but in reality, many analyses were conducted 
And by chance, a couple of them are going to be um, statistically significant, clean sounding, and, and therefore publishable, even though the entire body of evidence um, might be might be messier than the, the one path that was chosen by all of those um, justifiable decisions in hindsight. So how, what is a pre-registration and, and how can a pre-registration um, address these issues? A pre-registration is a time-stamped read-only version of your research plan created before the study. And we talk about two different types of pre-registrations. Um, if you just include the study plan, that will include the hypothesis, the data collection procedures, and the variables you collect. Um, everything that I'm going to be talking about for the uh, remainder of this webinar is a um, pre-registration plus an analysis plan. So that's when you include the uh, specific statistical model and the inference criteria that you're going to use to make a decision um, as to your hypotheses and predictions. Um, the pre-registration and the pre-registration with an analysis plan solves um, uh, different problems that I'll get to in a, in a few minutes. Um, but again, Everything from here on out, just assume I'm talking um, just about this one here on the right. So what problems does a, a do pre-registrations address? One is the file drawer issue that only a small percentage of work that is ever conducted ever sees the light of day in the published literature. Um, the other is that garden and forking paths issue. Um, there's a lot of flexibility in data analysis. Um, most of it goes unreported, um, even though a lot of it was conducted, and um, that Key value hacking um, can be um, more fully specified, the, can be addressed with a fully specified analysis plan in your pre registration. And the last major problem is, is harking, creating a hypothesis after results are known. Um, so, if you create a hypothesis after you see the data, what this results in is basically circular reasoning. Um, you've got a small, limited data set, you um, start looking through it, you create a hypothesis with that as you're looking through it, and then you use that same hypothesis in that same data set, and you've created um, a violation of the assumptions of the test. So, so this um, bit of circular reasoning is, is bad. Um, ultimately, what a pre-registration does is it makes it much more clear the difference between exploratory analyses and confirmatory analyses. So let me describe what those are. When you're confirming your results. This is what we normally think of as traditional um, hypothesis testing. Um, the results of this should be held to the um, highest standards of rigor. The goal when you're um, conducting confirmatory hypothesis testing is to minimize false positives, those type one errors. Um, and when you are conducting confirmative um, analysis confirmations, um, the, the p-values are interpretable. You create your hypothesis before using the data, um, and the p-value of 0.05 or less makes sense in that context. Unfortunately, a lot of the work that's done is actually um, in the context of discovery or um, data exploration. And this is totally um, uh, reasonable, but, is, uh, but, but, but in fact violates the laws of statistical analysis. The purpose of the discovery research is to push knowledge into new areas, find something that's unexpected, find unexpected differences or relationships between variables. And the goal here um, is really to minimize false negatives. You don't want to miss um, some unexpected discovery. You don't want to miss the next penicillin. Um, um, but this is a different context of discovery. And when you get a p-value using this type of data exploration, digging through a data set, um, any p-value that comes from that is, is pretty much meaningless. Um, and unfortunately, presenting those exploratory results as confirmatory results increases um, the publishability of the work, um, but that it comes at the expense of the credibility of the results. And normally individuals are, as I said, rewarded for presenting um, exploratory research as more confirmatory work. And a pre-registration keeps the line between the two very discreet. Anything that was pre-registered in your pre-registered analysis plan is your confirmatory analysis. Anything else you do, any other decision you make after starting to go through the data set after pre-registration, is um, exploratory analysis um, and should be treated as such. So here's a typical workflow that we recommend when you're um, going between these um, confirmation and um, exploration stages. You collect a little bit of new data, you use that data in the discovery phase, you dig through the data set, you look for unexpected relationships. Um, and once you have something that's, that you think is solid, 
you find a relationship, you find an analysis that comes with that um, magical p-value of 0.05 or less, um, you then pre-register that, that analysis that you just found, that hypothesis that you just created with that data exploration step. Then you use that to collect some new data, and using your pre-registered plan, you, you use that pre-registered plan for your um, confirmatory hypothesis testing. Um, and then, you know, the cycle can continue. You can um, create a new pre-registration, um, collect some more data, um, and you know, if you don't have a strong hypothesis going into it, you can be explicit about that in that pre-registration you just created, or whatever was specified ahead of time, you know, can then be used for um, um, confirmation or if not, exploration. A slight variation on this theme is um, uh, what we call um, uh, splitting a data set or, or, or taking a holdout sample. So this starts again with the pre-registration of whatever strong ideas you have going into it. You collect uh, some of the data set and then you split the data, randomly split the data set into two parts. And um, with half the data, you, you keep it in, a, in an Al Gore lockbox. You keep it secret, uh, put it on a different hard drive, put it in different folders, don't allow anybody to look into it because that's what you're going to use later on. Um, but use the half of the data that you're using for exploration to start digging through, looking for unexpected trends, um, you know, figuring out the best ways to construct your variables, um, figure out what IVs or DVs look most interesting. Do whatever you want during that um, stage with the um, data set you're playing with. And then once you have something that you think is um, worth sharing, that's exciting, that's unexpected, statistically significant, then create a pre-registration at that point. This is the real key pre-registration right here on the right. You create that pre-registration, then you can are free to uncover that um, half of the data that you had um, covered earlier and use those analyses that you just created with your, in your discovery phase in that next round, that um, confirmation phase. Maybe the results will replicate as you found in the discovery phase. Maybe they won't. Um, if they don't, then go ahead and start another round of discovery, looking for things that were unexpectedly significant um, to be used for the next round of, of data collection. So why pre-register? Well, the, the, the main point, the, the biggest reason to pre-register is that you add rigor and credibility to any claims that you made. Um, that's, that's the number one reason to to conduct these pre-registrations. If you want to add certainty, if you want to add um, rigor to the hypotheses that you are showing are significant, um, a pre-registration is the way to do it. Um, you also, there are other reasons too. You established a, a timestamp record of your idea, so you can establish priority that you have um, laid claim to this idea um, early on. It helps you remember exactly what your a prior hypotheses were, so that sounds a little bit silly, but um, you know, honestly, as you're going through a data set, as you are starting to analyze it, you, you start out with a, a, a pretty good idea of what your hypotheses are, but, but really that hypothesis is that very specific analysis plan that you created. Um, and that's the exact hypothesis that you should consider as your a priori hypothesis. Anything else, it's easy to shift slightly and fool yourself into thinking um, was an a priori hypothesis when it wasn't established beforehand specifically. Um, and it helps you create your next experimental design. So as you're going through a data set, you conduct the um, registered analyses. Anything else is exploratory and you find that, oh, well, the effect is significant if I control for X or Y or you know, remove outliers based on this rule. I wonder if that's really important. At that point, um, you've got a very strong case for what the next level of, what the next round of data collection should be for and what the next round of, um, your experimental, experimental manipulation could be. Um, and this one's a little bit tentative. You know, it could save time. It's a testable hypothesis. Hopefully we'll get some more empirical data on that as time goes on. Um, but you're more likely to spot errors when you do some of that legwork up front. So when you um, start writing down exactly how you're going to analyze the data, that can affect um, part of the experimental design that's easy to overlook if you leave those questions towards the end. Every question that goes into a pre-registration, every decision that goes into making a pre-registration is a decision that has to be made sometime. Um, so by putting it ahead of data collection, you're not adding to any time, um, you're just rearranging the workflow a little bit. And ultimately it might save time if you, um, if you catch errors um, by creating this pre-registration. 
So registration is a great thing. Um, we think so. We think um, that we want other people to, to give it a try. And so we have this competition funded by the Laura and John Arnold Foundation to give $1,000 prizes to 1,000 researchers for publishing the results of their pre-registered research. Um, the point of this is really an education campaign to encourage, to get people to try it out, um, to see if they like pre-registration, to see the benefits of the process for themselves, um, and, and to use that pre-registration all throughout the research workflow to see, um, to see its benefits. And so those $1,000 rewards are carrots to just try it out and see if it works for you. Um, we also know that most, most researchers have never created a pre-registration before. Um, and so we have a workflow on the Open Science Framework to, um, to create a pre-registration, to walk you through what needs to be included to create a pre-registration for your study and its complete analysis plan. So if you go to cos.io slash pre-reg, you'll get to this page. Um, information about what pre-registration is, information about the contest, um, and a link to begin your pre-registration. That will bring you into the Open Science Framework, the OSF. Um, and this is a screenshot of my account. Um, it gives me several options. It, I have draft pre-registrations, and so it's giving me the option to continue working on one of my drafts. Um, I have several projects on the OSF, so I can create a pre-registration for something else I'm working on the OSF. But if you're a first time user on the OSF, that's not, um, and this doesn't make any sense to you, you'll only be shown the option to start a new pre-registration and that'll jump you um, right into the workflow to create a pre-reg. Um, we um, have this notice as you go through to describe some of the um, rules about the contest. Um, one thing that we do do is check each pre-registration before, um, before it's registered, before it becomes a permanent copy. Um, and we just do a superficial check just to make sure that it is a um, complete analysis plan, that it's a fully specified research plan. Um, and we say on here that you'll hear back from us in 10 days. We're about to change that um, to, to one or two days. We almost always get back to somebody on the same business day. Um, so we're going to update this language uh, because our, our checks are getting very efficient. And we want to make sure that this isn't a barrier to anybody creating a pre-registration. So, um, you should know that we get back to you almost always within the same day, maybe two business days. Um, and, um, and that's going to be updated soon. If you have any other questions about these, um, about the, the rules, um, I'd be happy to answer them. But mostly it was created to make sure that it's a, you know, a fair and legal way to, to run a competition for this education campaign. And then it dumps you right into the form. Um, so in the pre-registration form, you're, it walks you through exactly what's required, um, the title, research questions, hypotheses. Um, it lets you describe how you're going to collect your data. One of the big questions for pre-registrations is can you use existing data? And the question is maybe, um, a resounding perhaps. Um, it, it really is was thought of and was designed for before data collection starts. But as long as you haven't, or the, or the researchers who are analyzing the data haven't seen the data that are coming through it, it's perfectly acceptable to use a pre-registration um, anytime before you start analyzing the data. Um, and the purpose of this is to give transparency um, and to allow researchers to conduct uh, work that would be impossible to conduct if they had to collect new data. So large data sets collected by the government, um, et cetera, et cetera, are you know, you are possible to, um, uh, you don't have control over when that data is collected, but you still um, could benefit from pre-registration. Um, an example of this is the um, American National Elections um, Studies Institute, and they um, collect survey data before and after um, national elections in the United States. And actually there's one going on in Italy also. And there are both competitions for, for those. The election research pre-acceptance competition has a very similar form um, and a very similar framework for that data collection effort that is um, coming from that um, survey data. As you're collecting your data, we do ask that you specify what your sample size um, is expected to be and, and how you came to that number and what you're going to do um, to, to stop data collection. What we're looking for here, um, you don't, 
It doesn't require that you use a power analysis to justify your sample size, but it does require you to be transparent about how you are collecting your data. Um, perhaps you only have money or time for a certain sample size. So just um, be transparent about how that came to be. And if you're collecting data on an ongoing basis, be transparent about um, when you're going to stop data collection. It could be after you get to 100 participants. It could be after you run out of money. It could be after you run out of time or, or some combination thereof. Um, but simply be transparent about that. What we um, don't want to see here is basically that um, you collect a little bit of data, see if it's significant, collect a little bit more, see if it's significant. As you start doing that, that's really data exploration that, um, again, breaks the rules of statistical inference. Um, um, Courtney later can give some more um, detailed answers about how you can do that in a, in a way if you have specified key values ahead of time, but uh, I won't go into that right now. Um, here it gives you the option to um, explain exactly what um, variables you're going to be um, collecting in your study, what, if it's an experimental design, what conditions are you manipulating, what variables are you measuring. Those measured variables could be independent or dependent variables. Um, and if you're constructing any variables or making an index, so perhaps your measure of happiness is a, an average of 10 different um, responses to different, 10 different survey questions. Or if you're an ecologist, you might be using a, a specific biodiversity index, Shannon's biodiversity index or something. Just specify how those complex variables are going to be created. Um, the analysis plan is the most detailed part about the pre-registration. Um, and this is the part that um, typically is not done until after data collection. But this is the part um, where we really want to um, research to spend the most time um, specifying in advance how the research questions are going to be um, analyzed. You do have the option to upload an analysis script, um, and that really answers basically all the questions in the pre-registration. If you've got that analysis script, you've, you've got all of the decisions um, about how the data are going to be analyzed ahead of time, and any changes from what was registered to what happens later is, is very transparent in, in the sense that if you make a change to your script, it's it's a pretty obvious change. So you, um, it's very distinct when you go from that confirmation to exploratory stage. At the end of your pre-registration form, you've got um, the ability to um, preview what you've got um, listed, go back and edit it or to submit it and have it registered. You've got the option at that point to create a pre-registration without entering the competition, or you've got the option to submit for review. And again, that takes about a day. And what we do is just check quickly to make sure it's a fully specified analysis plan. We'll look at your stopping rule. We'll look at your inference criteria just to make sure you um, filled out what was required for eligibility into this competition and get back to you right away. Um, and about half the time, there are a few comments. Um, about half the time, it's reg registered right away. Um, the last thing you'll see is a ability to make your registration public immediately or you'll have the ability to enter it into an embargo period. So you can um, make it private for up to four years, um, after which it'll become, become public. When you have your pre-registration on the OSF, there are a couple of things to note about it. Um, one is that you'll have a new URL. Your project will have this short osf.io slash a couple of numbers and letters. And that's a persistent link that you can use um, to cite, um, and that will will stay forever. Um, I'll get to withdrawing registrations in a minute, but, but even if you um, end up destroying your pre-registration for some reason, um, that link will always resolve. Um, and so it is a persistent link after you have a registration. Um, and then the form that you filled out with all the nitty gritty details about your research plan is right here um, listed under pre-reg challenge. And here's just an example of what it looks like. And you might be able to see in the background, it's just has a slight watermark, read only, read only as a reminder that this is a registration that cannot be edited. All right, so when you, it does come time to answer your, to um, write up your article, there are a couple of main points to remember. Um, one, make sure you include a link to your pre-registration. So that, that link, um, as I said, is a persistent citable link. You can create a DOI that, um, that will uh, include that, information and also that's one of the capabilities on the OSF. 
you do have to report the results of all pre-registered analyses. And so if you said you were going to run 100 t-tests, you have to report the results of all 100 t-tests um, or whatever you registered has to be um, written up um, regardless of whether or not they're significant. Um, and then anything that was unregistered has to be um, marked as such. You have to transparently state that something else was added to, to the study um, for this particular data collection effort. Um, so there are different ways to say that. You could say unregistered, you can say exploratory, um, you can say hypothesis generating analyses, but it just has to be somehow distinct that, um, that these other analyses were not part of the pre-registration. So here's an example of a recently published, oops, sorry, of a recently published um, study that was pre-registered on the OSF. This is one of the first that are going to be eligible for the $1,000 prizes. Um, and this was published in the Royal Society Open Science, um, and it was a, uh, a pre-registered direct replication of a study published in 2013. And you can see in the results that the authors described their registered analyses and the results of the registered analyses. So here, 4.2 pre-registered analysis on adjusted and adjusted effects. Um, and then they go through all of those different analyses and the results of all of those. And they have a section of unregistered exploratory analysis. So this makes very clear um, what types of analyses they thought of after looking through the data. Um, and then the reader, the editors, the peer reviewers are left to um, weigh the relative evidence of registered and unregistered analyses as they see fit. A common question that we have um, when people um, submit a pre-registration is what, if, what happens if I need to change my research plan? Um, well, there are a couple of different ways to, to answer that. Um, if you want to change your plans as you see the incoming results, that, that kind of breaks the rules of uh, registration. So basically what you need to do there is report what you said you were going to do and anything else that looks more interesting or more tantalizing, feel free to report on that, but just make sure it's distinct and noted that it's not registered. If you need to make, chance, make changes before seeing the data, um, there's a possibility you can, you can um, in the open science framework, withdraw a registration and you can create a new plan. But that's only valid, again, if you haven't seen the data yet or if you haven't started data collection. Um, so that is a possibility, but, um, but only under certain cir circumstances. If you have questions about, um, as you're going through the research plan and you, you wanna change something or something looks um, wonky that needs addressing, feel free to email us. Um, all the correspondence, once you get a, um, enter the competition, it goes to prereg at cos.io. Um, if you have been working with a journal, and I'll mention what a registered report is in a few minutes, um, but if you have been working with a journal and they have provisionally accepted your research plan for publication, that's called a registered report, um, you basically need to contact the editor and ask if this change would affect their results so their, or their decision. There are times when it, it might affect the decision. If you said you were gonna collect 100 participants and only collected 50, they might come back and say, no, you need to go back and get the full sample size. If you, you know, said you were going to sample fish at 100 meters and there were no fish at 100 meters, and so you had to go to 50 meters, that might be a justifiable plan that doesn't affect the inferential value of your statistical tests. Um, and so those are examples where um, editors have come back and said yes or no, you, you may or may not change your research plan. Um, but the editor or perhaps the peer reviewers will um, be the ones to answer that particular question. Uh, one common fear that comes up frequently is will this make my work less publishable? Um, and what this does do, what a pre-registration does, is it makes presenting any spurious findings as rigorous confirmatory tests, it makes that process harder. So if you've got spurious findings, um, it is hard to present them as rigorous confirmatory tests with a pre-registration. So in that sense, perhaps it could make it less publishable. However, there are, there are strong counter arguments. Um, a pre-registration is an extremely strong indicator of rigor for any confirmatory test. Um, and a major benefit is that it does help highlight those unexpected, those new testable hypotheses um, to you for the follow-up study or to future researchers who are working in the field. Um, and, you know, and furthermore, we expect that work that's not pre-registered um, will soon be viewed much, and rightly so, um, much more skeptically um, as work that was unpre-registered. If you don't pre-register, the, the work will be um, viewed much more skeptically. Um, so the risk is a little bit hard to quantify, 
Um, is it riskier to re register or not to pre-register? Um, and why not let the tiebreaker be erring on the side of rigor and, and better science? Um, so, so those are some of the um, issues that arise when, when you're wondering about whether or not this is a risky proposition. Does pre-registration work? Well, yes, there's a couple of key indicators that pre-registration is effective. Um, so this one particular study looked at the um, time-sharing experiments for social sciences that test registry. And what happens in this, um, this organization accepts questionnaires, accepts surveys from social science researchers, um, and, they, and they farm them out. They use their large pool of respondents to um, measure the responses on, of these questionnaires. And so this created uh, a registry, basically, of all of the conducted work. And what these three researchers did was compare what was submitted to tests in the questionnaires, um, compare, that's along the um, horizontal axis, compare that to what was actually reported in the articles, the, the outcome, the research articles. And so if every questionnaire reported the results of, um, if every article reported the results of every outcome variable in the questionnaire, they would all fall along this line. Um, if any articles happen to have added outcome variables, those would be dots represented above this line. Um, fortunately, that didn't happen in this case. Um, any articles that didn't report the results of everything that was in the questionnaire shows up below this line. So right away, you can see that not everything um, that was submitted to tests ended up in the published literature. Yeah, that could be fine. It could be um, an unbiased sample of what's getting out there in the literature. But fortunately, the researchers looked for that and compared what was in the reported tests, found a median p-value of um, 0.02, statistically significant, median effect size, 0.29, 63% of the reported results were statistically significant. Compare that to what was unreported. Um, the majority of tests were unreported, um, and the p-values of the, the median p-values was much higher, 0.35. The effect size, the Cohen's D, was half. Um, and only about 25% were statistically, statistically significant. So you can see that there is a strong bias in what was um, presented in the published literature, um, and therefore the published literature does not represent the, the full scale of reality compared to what was, what was um, actually conducted. Another example of pre-registration um, working is um, in 2000, pre-registration became required by law for large clinical studies. So these are basically pharmaceutical companies running clinical trials. Um, and in this case, it was um, cardiac studies looking for um, um, effects of different treatments or different drugs. Um, the vertical axis is the, the relative risk. So that um, gray line at one shows that there's no difference. The relative risk with or without treatment is one is the same. Anything above that line is the relative risk is higher with the treatment, so it's a little bit more dangerous. Um, anything below that line is um, less danger or you know, less risk or, or some sort of beneficial treatment from the beneficial effect from the treatment. And you can see before registration was required by law for these types of studies uh, that 57% um, of the outcomes were statistically significant, that positive results were 57%. After pre-registration became required by law, um, only 8%, only two of those studies that were conducted in, in the later time period um, were statistically significant, showed a positive effect after registration. So it shows a marked difference in um, what was reported before and after this went into effect. Um, again, registration is not required by law for, for most research, but this is the clinical sciences. A common fear about registration is that somebody will, will take your ideas and scoop you and, you know, take your... Um, take your research plans, um, use it themselves, and get um, beat you to the finish line. Um, that's, um, you know, perhaps that could happen, but a pre-registration pre does protect you in several ways. It is a date stamped um, documentation of when your claim was made, of when your research plan was created. By the time you created that pre-registration, you're already basically ready to start data collection. So you're ahead of anybody else who might be lurking through the registries, looking for um, a good idea to, to use in their own research. Um, and then finally, we do offer the up to four years of embargo. And so that, um, you know, if you have a four-year head start on anybody else, that's a pretty, um, pretty solid evidence that your ideas won't get scooped in a reasonable time frame.
And about roughly about 40% or so of people who are um, entering the registration challenge choose to make their registrations uh, public immediately. So that, um, that's a little bit higher than I kind of expected initially. I was expecting, I don't know what it was. I should have pre-registered my expectation. But that's pretty high, I thought. Um, something that comes up frequently when we um, discuss pre-registration is the fear that it's, it's easy to cheat. So it is theoretically easy to cheat and make your work seem more rigorous than it is. You can make a pre-registration, in quotes, um, after you conduct the study. So conduct the study, um, do a whole bunch of p-hacking, you know, just start looking for those data exploration steps. Um, once you find something significant, make that a pre-registration and then present that as um, evidence that, that you found something rigorous. Or another way to cheat would possibly to make dozens of different registrations, all with slight variations, um, and, and only citing the one that worked. Well, both of those, um, the answer to both of those is that it, yes, you could do that. Um, however, those steps make creating fraud much harder to do, um, but, but even more importantly, they make creating fraud much more intentional. So most of what I've been talking about, most of the rationale for these open science practices aren't to prevent fraud because there's always going to be a way to, to lie, to, to create, conduct fraud. Most of the rationale for open science practices is to help you keep honest to your, help your, help yourself be honest to yourself. That didn't come out right, but, but just to, um, you know, make sure you don't fool yourself with those subtle biases as you're analyzing a data set. Um, and, and an unexpected benefit is that it um, makes fraud more explicit. And so if, if you are intending to deceive, um, you know, p-hacking isn't the way to do it because it's, everybody is, is affected by that, honestly. But if you really want to cheat the system and start doing some of these things, um, it really crosses that line. It makes it pretty obvious that you have malintent. Um, and so, so there is um, that other side benefit. But again, the primary benefit is that it helps um, yourself to make sure you keep your biases in check because we all face them. Um, the final point uh, that I'd like to make is an extension of the pre-registration process and that's called registered reports. Um, so everything we've talked about so far can be done in a very typical research cycle. You conduct your pre-registered study as you do, as you see fit, you submit it to a journal, um, you make clear what was registered and what was not, and then you hope for the best. Um, with the registered report, you submit the pre-registration to a journal. So you um, basically have an introduction and a method section justifying the importance of the research question, why this question has to be answered, um, and justify your proposed methods um, and their ability to address that question. Um, the peer review process will evaluate those. The peer review process is, will be very critical in terms of making sure that any null results will be interpretable. So they're more likely to include manipulation checks. So some sort of verification that your experiment worked even if you didn't get significant findings. Um, so those types of checks are much more likely to happen in that first stage of peer review than would normally happen um, because if it passes this stage of this stage one of peer review, um, the journal is obligated to publish it um, regardless of outcome. So they want to make sure that the research was conducted as rigorously as possible and that any null results are, are true negatives um, and not just some sort of failure of the experimental manipulation. So again, um, that first stage of peer review evaluates the, the necessity to answer those questions and the ability of the methods proposed to address them. And accepted proposals are guaranteed publication regardless of outcome. Right now there are 43 journals um, currently accepting registered reports. You can learn more at cos.io slash rr. I should have a pirate joke right there, but don't. Um, um, and they span the sciences fairly broadly right now. I showed an example just a few minutes ago, the um, Royal Society Open Science um, conducts uh, register reports for a very wide spectrum of the scientific discipline. Um, a lot of the um, other journals are in um, psychology, social psychology, a couple of neuroscience, a couple of infancy journals. Um, there's a, a pretty wide range. Um, the largest recent cohort I mentioned uh, um, recently is in political science, 
with that upcoming American and National Election Survey um, data set that will be released this coming April. Um, with that, I would like to simply say thank you. And I would be happy to answer any questions. You can use the Q&A feature at the top of your window. It's at the top, I think. Um, or enter the chat room. And Courtney and I would be happy to answer any questions that come through. Any question? Let's see a couple of them. A whole bunch of questions coming in now. So. Oh, good, lots of questions. Okay, let me, um, I'll answer them as um, we see fit. Courtney, if you see any that um, are right up your alley, feel free to tag them. I'll just start from the um, top here. Any tips for working with students on registering their projects? I'll answer uh, live. Um, any tips for working with students? So this um, entire process was basically created as an education campaign. So um, the process really lends itself well to students. It's the, the most similar analogy to this uh, registration that most people are familiar with is master's and um, PhD um, um, proposals, because those tend to have them more detail than, than grant proposals or any other research plan. Um, and so the process really lends itself very well to the um, registration process. As long as there are enough of those um, analysis details, you know, submitting a um, any sort of thesis proposal um, as a registration is a really is a very good idea. Um, it helps um, you know instill best practices early on, um, and it helps especially those design issues that are very likely to come up. Um, as you start thinking more concretely about the data analysis. Um, so I don't have any specific tips besides saying, yes, <laughs> you should do it. Um, but, um, but it does lend itself well to that. Yeah, so can an embargoed registration be unembargoed? So for example, you submit it as a preprint. Yes, um, if you create an embargo for four years, um, and you're ready to unveil it after one, yeah, you can uh, make it public and be um, sooner than you expected. There's a, um, a little option when you go back to the OSF project, there'll be a button to make public. Um, and that allows you to make it public sooner than you anticipated. Um, so yes. How do you see the process of proposing and creating research studies changing over the next five years? Um, you know, one of the things we're working hard to expand that list of registered reports. There's currently 43. We are currently working with some funding agencies to um, make that a joint process, not only um, submitting to a journal, but submitting funding, a funding request um, for that proposed research study along the same time as you would um, submit it to a registered report for consideration. Um, so I, I think those types of trials over the next five years will will grow. Um, there'll be more um, examples of um, journals that accept registered reports, so um, in principle acceptance before results are known. And, um, and I know for a fact that at least one, and I know that there are, there's interest in several other funding agencies for partnering with these journals um, to grant funding to an accepted registered report. Um, it's, it's a complication on that workflow about registered reports because both the funding agency and the journal have to agree that it's worth funding and publishing. Um, but, the, but the rationale for doing that is the same as for doing it for a registered report. And so we, have, uh, we do expect that to be um, an option to, to more researchers in the next, in the next coming years. Uh, Pat says, how many people have, oh, have entered the pre-reg challenge? We have about 500 um, registrations that have been accepted for the competition. 
We have about another 500 that have registered their research plans um, on the OSF but not entered it into the competition. Um, and then there are other ways to register on the OSF. You can um, you know, just write down your answers in a form, you know, in just a Word document, upload it to the OSF, create what we call an open-ended registration um, that doesn't have that long form associated with it. Um, um, we do have um, a, a similar form as the aspredicted.org registration system. Um, and we have a couple of other research forms on OSFs to guide people through different types of pre-registrations. Um, and there have been, um, so the pre-reg competition has just been alive for a year. Um, and these other types of registering have been around for a varying amount of time. So there are several thousand other registrations on the OSF that, um, that may or may not um, qualify as a, as a pre-registration, you know, one that's conducted before results are known. Is there, um, in terms of uploading, is there a content file size limit? I think five gigabytes per file is the upload limit. There's no um, limit to how much content you can store in the OSF, um, but I believe that, is it also five for per registration? I think there's a, another five gigabyte, li five gigabyte limit for the amount of content that can be created in a, in a registration. So roughly five gigabytes, but you can, um, but there's no preset limit to how much storage you can use on the OSF. Um, and that five gigabyte limit is basically a, a technical limitation. It becomes much harder to deal with larger files than that. How specific do the analysis plans need to be? For example, do you need to specify the survey items, manipulations, transformations, et cetera? Um, so the answer generally is it needs to be quite specific. Quite specific. You, you don't have to um, give the entire survey, but you do have to describe um, uh, how the variables are going to be created from any survey that you do use. So let's say you have 100 questions on your survey, um, and one of your IVs is going to be an average of a, a, you know, a subset of those. Um, that are created on a, on a Likert scale or a Likert scale, depending on how you pronounce it. You do have to describe how that um, you would go from the survey to the variables that are going to be used in your analysis. Um, you don't have to give the, um, the full survey. A lot of people do uh, go end up and attach the survey document to their pre-registration. But if you, if you describe the, the exact process that you'll use, you don't have to um, include the survey. Manipulations and like manipulation checks. You should include manipulation checks. Um, um, and if you don't remember to, you can um, you know, describe it as unregistered when you write up your final report. Um, I think Courtney will have more to say on this also, um, uh, some of the important things to remember on the analysis plan. Yeah, so to follow up on what David said, um, the pre-reg challenge does require quite a specific pre-registration. Um, however, pre-registration, like many things, is kind of a continuum. Um, the more you pre-specify, the more you cut down on those researcher degrees of freedom and the more confirmatory um, your analyses are. Um, However, a lot of times, if you're pre-registering for the first time, um, this is something that is new to a lot of researchers. Um, and so just kind of like any um, new habit or new skill, um, trying to do kind of the perfect one to start with may be a pretty high hurdle. Um, so I know many researchers who are just, you know, trying pre-registration for the first time, some of them will go in and try the pre-reg um, challenge, even though it requires kind of more specifics because there is that support um, around it. But uh, other researchers will try just kind of a simple pre-registration pre to start with, like specifying just, you know, their intended sample size, um, maybe um, their, you know, the broad statistical test they're going to do, their IVs and their DVs, but they won't go and do some more specific things like transformations or um, you know, follow-up test or something like that. Um, and so even though they haven't gone the full way and done, you know, incredibly detailed pre-registration, even making those few um, choices up front do decrease the researcher degrees of freedom they have for that particular study. Um, and so 
I, I would say think of it as a continuum with the more you specify leading to fewer potential um, degrees of freedom there. Yeah, and the more you specify, the, the more rigor you add to it. So there's a relationship there. Um, is, it typical, is it typical to submit a registered report at the same time as you pre-register on the OSF? Um, so if you are, would like to submit a registered report um, to a journal for in-principle acceptance, uh, you can do a couple of different things, but one um, decent workflow would be to submit to the journal first get your, um, because they're going to have very um, substantial comments that the peer reviewer will obviously give, you know, expert content advice on what you're going to be doing and the, the validity of the research questions. And so the likely changes that are going to come to that are, are pretty substantial. Once you have that in principle acceptance, then you can submit it to the, um, you can create a pre-registration. Um, if you want to enter the competition, just attach that um, document that you have um, had in principally accepted. All the other fields you can just say see, <laughs> see attached document, that's okay. Um, and, and then pre-register at that point. If you create a pre-registration and then um, go to a journal, um, you're likely to have an, an update required to your, to your plan. And that's fine, you just create a new pre-registration based on the feedback that you get from the peer review process. Um, and then what that'll do is create a trail of the evolution of your research plan as it goes through different stages of peer review. That's perfectly fine. There's no um, um, ethical problem with doing that, but it's just you know, a couple of um, different steps to, to take into account. So if you're thinking of getting it submitted to a, a journal that's conducting registered report, I suggest that you go through them first. All right, uh, so somebody asked, um, if p-values are meaningless for exploratory research, what statistics evidence can be used for exploratory research? Um, so I'll kind of answer this in two ways. Um, for some types of exploratory research, there actually is a way to um, adjust the p-value to take into account that exploration. So for example, some of you may be familiar um, with post hoc comparison. So if you've done um, you know, an ANOVA, and then after seeing the data, you decide what comparisons you want to make. Um, we have things like, uh, we have a ways to adjust the p-value for the fact um, that that was done post hoc. Usually you'll have to adjust for all possible comparisons, um, whereas if you made that assumption a priori, you would only have to adjust for the number of comparisons that you'd a priori plan to do. Um, the reason that that's kind of a special case of that is because you kind of know how many possible things you could have looked at. Um, with most exploratory analyses, though, it becomes difficult to kind of quantify how many possible comparisons um, or different models could have been run. When you don't know how many variables somebody has, when, you know, you don't know how many transformations they could have done. And so that's why it becomes difficult to interpret the p-values because you don't know how much the false positive rate was potentially inflated, and so you don't know how much to correct for that. Um, in those types of cases, um, what can be useful to look at is things like the direction of the effect, um, potentially effect size. So just getting an idea of, is there potentially something there? What direction is it going in? Does that kind of match up with, you know, maybe theories that are out there, or if it's a theoretical work, you know, does this kind of have base valid sense to it? There are also things you can do, um, for example, um, some sort of um, uh, capable analyses where you're doing a bit of work to kind of test how many different ways can you slice the data and does the effect keep showing up in those different slices. It's not quite like a holdout sample like David was talking about because you are um, using the same pieces of the data as your, as your training in your test set. You're just basically um, holding out some of them on each go around. Um, but it can be a good option if you don't have the option for a true holdout sample to kind of see how, um, how robust your results are across different facets of your data. So hopefully that made sense. <laughs> uh, next one, would grant funders fund pre-registered replications of non-registered exploratory studies? Um, uh, sort of two answers to that. Right now, um, 
most granting agencies are, are not funding um, pre-registered replications for, for, um, for any work. Um, that's something that there are ongoing discussions within funding agencies about the um, necessity and the value and, and how best to go about doing that. Um, there are a couple of research agencies, I think in the Netherlands, who are funding, I think the, um, the, the National Science Foundation equivalent um, in the Netherlands are um, funding some replication studies, but many, most, I think, um, are not funding that. Um, and a, a little cynical point, um, you mentioned non-registered exploratory studies. I would um, cynically say that a lot of the work that's out there is essentially, even if it's being presented as confirmatory evidence, is non-registered exploratory findings. So the, the reproducibility project in psychology has demonstrated that a lot of the work is very difficult to reproduce. Um, there are ongoing um, reproducibility projects in, in cancer biology and social sciences that are, um, I won't spoil the, the news, but um, it's also hard to replicate work in, in many other fields because there are um, a lot of confirmatory work being presented as explored, or exploratory work being presented as confirmatory work. Um, so, so right now the short answer is no, um, but, it's, um, but it's an advocacy and a, an education campaign that um, the community is working on. Is pre-registration open for researchers from developing countries, especially from Africa? Yes, um, they definitely are. Um, we want this to be a worldwide competition. We, we um, do have some limitations in the number of um, countries we can um, send awards to, and that's to, um, because of some of the complications of running an international um, uh, competition. So there are like 15 or so countries where you can't participate in the competition. Um, but, it, but the tool is available to researchers worldwide. Um, and if, if you're in one of those countries that we can't um, send money to, then I'd be happy to work with you in other ways to get involved with open science. But the short answer is yes, it's open to everybody. Um, everything in the OSF is available to anybody across the world. A most appropriate time span to keep the project in the embargo period? Well, the maximum is four years. Um, the minimum is obviously zero, public immediately. Um, and you know, in between that, it's really up to you. I would recommend um, if you want to keep it private while you're doing the study to make an estimate for how long it'll take you to collect and write up the data. Um, then maybe tack on 20% <laughs> um, and make that what you think the embargo period should be if you want it to be private while you're working on it. Um, but otherwise, it's completely up to you. Um, yeah. One guy. Um, so, so far, we have uploaded Word documents with all the necessary pre info on the OSF and made this public. Is there a downside to this approach compared to going through the successive steps on the OSF? Um, so, no, essentially um, they, they reached the same goals. Um, the, the purpose of the steps that I showed was to demonstrate creating a pre-registration for somebody who, is, who doesn't know what needs to be included or to um, guide somebody through a workflow of, of creating a pre-registration. There's no substantive difference between that and uploading a Word document to the OSF and then registering your project. And that just, again, creates that uh, frozen read-only version of your project. There's no scientific rash or statistical rationale for going one way or the other. Um, we do want to make the competition available to everybody. And so um, even if you're uploading a Word document, you can still you know, fill out the form and just say, see Word doc, see Word doc, see Word doc for all the different answers. Um, and that gets us into our administrative backend portal so that we can uh, make sure you're eligible for the competition because we do want to give out $1,000, $1,000 prizes. So um, um, I encourage you to use that form even if you have a workflow that works for you. When you create a registration on the OSF, you'll have different options of um, using the form or just using an open-ended um, registration. Um, and the only way to get one of those prizes is to use the pre-reg challenge form. But otherwise, you can create a, um, a pre-registration in any way that you think is fit. You know, you could theoretically create pre-registrations in, in many different ways, um, which I didn't go into today. Um, oh, yes, the Italian constitutional referendum pre-acceptance competition. Um, let me just show what this is. And I, I, ooh, I can't copy and paste. I'll just Google it every time I work. 
Italian research. There it is. I was just on it recently. So it's just Google Italian research um, pre-acceptance competition. Let me see if I can get this link out to everybody in the workflow. Um, this uses the pre-edge challenge form. Um, and so you'll be eligible for anything based on, on that. Um, but you'll also be using a data set that is forthcoming based on survey data that was taken before and immediately after the recent um, Italian referendum. So let me put this link into the chat window. Hopefully this will work. Yes, hopefully everyone saw that. Um, so if you um, are interested in um, Italian political science, use that. Um, the date for um, that pre-registration competition is February 8th. Um, so that's when the data are going to be released from that um, particular data set. The American National Election Survey is, uh, is expected to be earlier mid-April. Let me give that link also. Come on. ERPC. Okay. Um, and I'm in trouble with the typo with the chat box here, but it's erpc2016.com. What can I do if someone scoops my purchaser project? Well, you can, so if you see um, something that you know was, was your analysis um, and was your specific research plan that's showing up um, later, um, if you've got strong evidence that it, that it was legitimately scooped and not just somebody working in a similar question in a similar field. Um, you know, the, the, um, the editor that, that published that work should be aware of what, um, what ideas might have been stolen. So you've got strong evidence that these research plans were created on a specific date just by using that link that you were provided with on the OSF. Um, and if it, if it looks like there was plagiarism or if it looks like there was a very specific analysis um, that was taken from that um, and, and used without, you know, your knowledge. Um, that becomes a, a you know an ethical consideration that um, that the editor, the peer reviewers, the institutional, um, the the office of sponsored research at universities might get involved. So those are the um, um, you know people who have a say on the ethical compliance of you know stealing research plans, basically. <laughs> Are there any best practices for registration? Any guides for people getting started? Yeah, you know, I think just um, going through the the form from cos.io slash pre-reg um, is the most practical step-by-step -step process. You know, the biggest questions in creating a registration is um, what needs to be included, and then in the registration, and then what needs to be included in the final article, um, and that's just going to take um, experience. And so the the step-by-step -step walkthrough. Um, on the, um, the OSF that you can get to from cos.io slash pre-reg. Mm. Uh, not working now, okay. Um, it is the most practical technique I have for sort of a step-by-step -step guide for somebody getting started. Are there accepted techniques for pre-registering studies without needing to trust the registrar? If Courtney has an opinion on that. Yeah, so if I interpret this question right, um, I think what this means is, can you pre-register um, by kind of publicly stating this, this information a priori without putting it into some sort of registry that's run by a third party system? Um, if that's not the question, you know, please follow up. Um, so, the point about a pre-registration is to kind of make the researcher accountable to um, kind of what they plan to do beforehand and make it so that they, the reviewers, and the readers can go and check this information. Um, and so you want that information to be someplace that's always going to be accessible um, and is always going to be kind of stably accessible. So, um, 
and if it's taken down, there's a notice that something was there that was taken down. Um, so for example, you could put a pre-registration, you know, on your personal website, um, but that wouldn't typically be considered kind of a true stable pre-registration because of the fact that, um, you know, your personal website, you might take it down all of a sudden, or you might move schools and just kind of forget to transfer things. Um, and so best practice really is to put it in some sort of um, registry, whether it be run um, on the OSF or something like clinicaltrials.gov if you're in the US and are doing um, clinical work, um, or some other um, specific groups have their own registries, for example. Um, and so that's why you typically want to put pre-registrations in these uh, trusted repositories. If I pre-register my study now, I've just finished writing my protocol and plan to begin testing within a couple of months, do I qualify for the competition? Yes. Um, how do you determine who wins? Um, so we've got a, a preset set of dates for when we're going to review who has published their research, but basically when it's been accepted for publication, send us an email. Um, and um, if you qualify, you'll be sent a $1,000 check um, at the next approved time. So every six months, we're going to be sending out um, prizes. Um, so it goes for the next until the um, end of 2018. So there are several couple more years um, that this competition will be running. Um, and we wanted to make it fair for everybody, even those who are conducting um, fairly long studies. Um, and so you've got a couple of, of years left. So please do enter the competition. We do actively want people to enter this. Um, and we do reserve most of the awards towards the end of the competition just to make it fair so that um, people who are conducting longer studies or people who are have longer peer review processes which isn't up to them obviously uh, make it fair to everybody who's involved um, so yes is it worth pre-registering exploratory research yes um i think courtney has a strong opinion on this too yeah, so um, when you think about a pre-registration, um, it kind of has two parts and serves two purposes. Um, one is just the explanation of what the study is and what variables are going to be collected and what the study design is. Um, and then there's this analysis plan component. The analysis plan is really there to decrease these researcher degrees of freedom. Um, but by putting, by pre-registering the design itself, and putting that in a um, repository that will eventually become public, what that helps to do is decrease the file drawer effect. Um, so this effect where um, studies that aren't published are really difficult to discover and find. Um, and so even if work is completely exploratory, it can be useful to pre-register the design of the study um, so that down the line, um, other researchers can figure out that that work was done, even if it doesn't eventually get published. Um, so if I see in a registry, you know, a couple years from now, that 20 different research teams did exploratory work um, looking at, you know, some particular um, group of variables and none of them got published, that might be useful for me to know if I'm thinking about starting up research in that area. Um, additionally, what it can do is if you say, you know, here's my study, here are the variables I'm going to collect, this is completely exploratory. Um, when you then go to publish, you'll also have that check where, um, you know, you have that pre-registration that says, hey, remember, everything I plan to do is exploratory. Um, and so that'll kind of help as a memory check for you when you're analyzing your own data to say, right, all of this was exploratory. Have there been issues publishing pre-registered work in terms of journals copyright laws? So something has been shown to be published um, that are publicly available already. Um, so that's, uh, I know that's a common fear with like a preprints, for example, where um, it's already been put out there and so the journal is, is not going to publish it because it's um, been in the public domain. I've never heard of that with pre-registration. Um, it would in my opinion, be a gross misuse of the copyright laws because of the, the point of registration is, is not to disseminate information um, widely in a community, which is the point of preprints and publications, um, but, but rather to make the, um, you know, ad rigor to the study. So I can't promise that it would never happen, but it would be extremely, it would be an extreme misuse of the copyright laws. So that's coming from somebody who's not a lawyer, so I don't, can't promise it won't happen, but I've never heard of it happening. 
What are your recommendations for dealing with advisors that won't involve themselves with registration? Courtney. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so there are a couple of ways you can handle this. Um, if your advice, so there are a couple ways you can handle this depending on, you know, how not involved your advisor wants to be. If it's the sort of thing where your advisor says, you know, I don't want to deal with the process of pre-registering, but I don't care if you do, um, then you can put together a pre-registration, um, you know, yourself for the challenge um, and just not force them to review it. Um, there are some advisors um, who are kind of actively against the process of pre-registration, in which case um, they might be very against you actually submitting something to a public um, or eventually public um, registration repository. Um, and that becomes a little bit more difficult because as a grad student, um, it or a postdoc, it puts you in a little bit of an awkward position where um, you want to engage in these behaviors, but that could make your um, your relationship with your advisor a little bit uh, uh, difficult. <laughs> a little bit difficult. A little bit testy. Um, in that case, I think one thing that you can do um, is kind of do a private pre-registration. Um, so you know, write out on your computer or on your own hard drive, kind of your pre-analysis plan. Um, by not uploading it to a repository, that's not going to help kind of other people verify that what you claim is confirmatory and exploratory really is, but it will at least serve as kind of a memory check to yourself. A lot of these researcher degrees of freedom or p-hacking behaviors um, happen because it's really easy for us to trick ourselves um, because we have memory issues, we have these confirmation biases. Um, and so if you do write these things down and just keep them, you know, for yourself, that can be, you know, a very small step. It won't go as far as putting it in public repository because nobody will be able to verify it. Um, but that is kind of a middle ground. If you want to engage in this behavior, but your advisor is very much actively against actually putting it um, in a public repository. Um, I should just mention we are over time. Um, I'll stay until the cows come home answering questions, but um, you know, feel free to leave when you need to, but I'll just keep on going through these questions. Um, on the side of the review process, besides journals, is there any interest on the part of OSF to work with conference organizers and peer review committees uh, towards codifying um, uh, different types of peer review practices, such as double blind or single blind review processes? Um, and this can address different biases from incoming members, or um, it can also address biases with sexism in research. Um, we don't have a, a strong policy statement on um, the, the cost and benefits of double blind or single blind review processes. We think it's um, um, a good thing to explore, and I think it's a good thing to test out, but this isn't something that we have um, um, yet come to consensus on about what's the um, you know, best way to address these biases um, in the peer review process. Um, our strongest policy document is the top guidelines. If you want to take a look at what those are right now, um, cos.io slash top, and those um, get into our policy positions about data sharing, um, registration, replications, registry reports. Um, and there is discussion, there's ongoing discussion about um, ways to make the peer review process more fair and transparent, um, and ways to make preprint policy more fair and transparent. Um, but those are sort of ongoing discussions, and um, um, we're waiting to see what the most effective method at adding rigor to science is. Um, that's basically all I know about that right now. So I'm going to um, skip the next. I think um, Courtney already answered those two questions about um, registering a pilot study, like exploratory research, um, um, and after that to register the main confirmatory study. So yes, there is benefit to that, um, but we've already answered most of that. What changes in the bridge process when you have Bayesian statistic in your analyses? Um, Courtney may have more to add to this, but basically the registration process is the same. You specify in advance um, how you're going to collect and analyze the data. Obviously, Bayesian inferences um, 
are more robust to some of these biases, but, but not to all of them. It is possible to selectively report or selectively analyze data in a Bayesian framework. Um, Courtney, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, so I would say, um, you know, some of the types of information you would include in the different pre-registrations is going to be the same, just like what is uh, the general design of the study, what variables are going to be manipulated and collected. Um, but one thing, you know, you might see in a pre-registration that uses Bayesian analyses or base factor analyses is information about um, what prior distributions are going to be set. Um, if you're doing base factor, what cutoff criteria are you going to use? Um, for kind of determining um, no weak, moderate, or strong evidence for and against the null. Um, or if you plan to run a couple of different um, you know, prior distributions to see how robust the effects are to different choices of priors, you might um, pre-specify that so it's clear um, if there was um, full reporting of all the priors that were um, that were chosen. So much of the information might be the same, but you also might get some differences in the information you would want to include um, because of the different types of information that you're going to use to specify the Bayesian analyses. The competition will be um, live until the end of 2018. So, um, you know, the next uh, six months or a year, submit your registrations if you want a reasonable chance of getting a, one of the $1,000 prizes. Everything, all the infrastructure on the OSF that we're using now is going to remain there. Um, and we're expanding the registration system on the OSF for the next couple months to be on the lookout for um, new ways to register. So all that infrastructure will be there forever, but the prize competition period will end at the end of 2018. Um, if you make your own document, your pre-registration document, and set it to private on the OSF, will it be subject to the embargo period? So if you don't register it, if you have a private project on the OSF, um, that never becomes public in, unless you um, say it should become public. Um, and everything that you do on the OSF is there's a, a log record of when that was added and removed, so you, you, um, you know, can um, share that when and if you have, but it's not a proper registration um, because it, it doesn't ever have to become public. We will, I'll email everybody who registered for this uh, webinar to make sure that um, you get a link to the recorded version. Um, so check your inbox for that. Um, additionally, all our webinars are recorded um, and uploaded to our YouTube channel. So if you ever lose the link, um, you can go to YouTube and look for the Center for Open Sciences um, YouTube channel. Um, usually give us about a week or so to um, you know, edit and upload the video. Um, but if you don't see it after that, feel free to you know, bug us about it. <laughs> will the OSF remain free of charge permanently? Will there be fees down the road? We have no plans for any fees um, down the road. We're a nonprofit tech organization supported by um, private and public foundations. Um, our long-term plans you know, will involve um, some sort of shared governance model where um, we hope organizations are supporting the, the infrastructure that we're building and the policies that we're promoting, um, but there's no plans um, for, for user fees. Um, and I should also note that if we do, unfortunately, run out of money next week and have to turn off the lights, um, there is an endowment um, to make sure everything that is persistent on the OSF stays there. Um, even if we do run out of money, there is money to support that persistent copy of the OSF. If I don't belong to a university, um, can I participate? Yeah, you know, um, if you don't, there are no credentials required. You just have to have an OSF account. You have to be able to get research published in, in a journal. Um, so that's the requirement uh, for that. I do not have information on the competition in the Spanish. Um, I'm sorry. Yes, do I have a template to fill information for formats or initial work to begin the study? So if you go to the pre-reg challenge, uh, cos.io slash pre-reg, cos.io slash pre-reg, um, it should, maybe it should be higher up. Um, there are these templates on steps to take to earn the prize. 
If you prefer to design um, your research um, offline, you've got these Google Docs and Word Doc templates um, that you can just answer all the questions and use that as you wish. And then once you're ready to um, use the OSF, you can um, copy and paste as you wish. So there are templates available also. Available at cos.io slash prereg. Um, do you offer a basic course to begin the process or make use of the best practices um, for getting better in this process? Um, let me think. All of the training materials are found on the OSF, OSF training resources. Um, and that's a project that Courtney maintains. Let's see, where did I put that? You have to look for that. I will share that. Let's see, training. Where's the best way to find that? Hold on one moment while I find that. So there aren't currently any training materials specifically for pre-registration. Um, outside of kind of the, the template itself, which um, walks you through the process. Um, but if you have particular questions, if you're trying to do a pre-registration um, for a study, you can always email us at contact at cos.io and we'll be happy to answer particular um, questions that you might have. And, and here's a page with links to a lot of our training resources, cos.io slash stats consulting. Um, so it's under services on the COS page. Do I have a fact um, to check things out about this? Yep, it's cos.io slash prereg, hashtag fact, uh, FAQ. Right there, cos.io slash prereg, slash FAQ. Do we have someone in your staff that can make this sewing webinar in Spanish? No, uh, but if you um, know of anybody who would be interested in um, conducting a Spanish language webinar, email us, contact at cos.io, and um, I think that's a, a worthy endeavor, so I think um, we could work with you to figure out a way to uh, make that a reality. So we do not have anybody, but, um, but that's something that we could work with you on. Uh, link with information about the legal and copyright issues and the, um, send it to OSF. Uh, do, 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 do. Where is the eligibility criteria? So cos.io slash prereg, the link for eligibility criteria has the um, big points here and a link to all of the terms and conditions um, for the competition is right here. Um, so that's just waiting for it to load. Sorry. So this is the complete eligibility criteria um, with um, rules and requirements for what you do at each step along the process, um, and that is accessible from again cos.io/prereg. Do I offer a step-by-step -step, um, bachelor level to promote the $1 million per registration challenge? At, um, the, the webinar will be recorded and presented for you to use. And I, th I think besides that and the registration form itself are the two best ways that are sort of BS level, um, bachelor's level um, work. And do I have to get, yes, so uh, everything that's on the OSF is open source and you can find it, let's see here, github.com slash, I think it is center for open science slash OSF.io. 
So all the code that goes into the um, open science framework is um, free and open source. Um, and if there are um, things in there that you think should be included, if you're a developer, if you um, see anything in there, you are welcome and encouraged to do that. We do you know, occasionally have um, non-employees you know, take a look at and suggest improvements or um, new ways to add content into um, different parts of the code base. So we do encourage and welcome that. All right, that was exciting. Um, I think I've answered all the questions. If there are if any more questions come through, um, feel free to email us. Um, happy to <laughs> um, answer any more questions over Twitter or email. And I think everything for getting into contact with us is basically right here, pre-reg at cos.io.